Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's show is sponsored by Bob's Red Mill, employee owned and operated and founded on the principle of good food for all. Learn more at bobsredmill.com slash podcast. My name is Hannah Forden. I'm the membership coordinator at Heritage Radio Network, but even before I joined the team, I loved listening to HRN during my subway commute. It made the time go quickly and left me feeling inspired for the day ahead. HRN listeners tune in from all over the world, but there are a few traits that we all have in common. No matter where we listen from, a curious palate, the fierceness to make a difference, and a hunger for lifelong learning about the culinary world. As you know, Heritage Radio Network is a listener-supported nonprofit. To deliver the most ambitious, entertaining, and of-the-moment stories in 2018, we need your help. We need to raise $150,000 by December 31st to accomplish these goals and to keep your favorite shows on the air. Together, we can make this HRN's most exciting, impactful, and delicious year yet. Become a member by donating today. Join us at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate, and you'll immediately start enjoying benefits such as VIP invitations to HRN events, where you will mix and mingle with your favorite hosts. Memberships also make a perfect holiday gift for all the foodies in your life. This year, why not give the gift of food radio? You'll hear your generosity in action for the year to come. Help keep our lights on and our mics hot by pledging your support today at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. Thanks for listening. All right, you're listening to Eat Your Words on Heritage Radio Network, and I'm your host, Kathy Irway. We're here at Roberta's Pizza, as usual, the home of Heritage Radio Network. And um, I wanted to start out with, um, you know, I've been personally, whenever I shop for chicken or other poultry, I've been seeing an increasing uh, trend in labels like no antibiotics ever. Or, you know, if you've been following some news, a lot of fast food companies have been pledging to have no antibiotic meat or antibiotic free meat by year 20 XX. And, um, it's, it's all this talk about antibiotics is actually part of a story that has been brewing for quite a while for some 70 years, but is, uh, reaching a fevered pitch in terms of urgency. And it's a really important story. Um, But I doubt that most people would know how riveting this story is and how interesting it is in the hands of a capable writer, at least. So I'm really happy to be joined by Maren McKenna. She is the author of a wonderful book called Big Chicken, The Incredible Story of How Antibiotics Created Modern Agriculture and Changed the Way the World Eats. Hi, Maren. How are you? Hi. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, thanks so much for writing this book. You've been um, an award-winning journalist, investigative journalist, written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Wired, Scientific American, so forth, so forth. Um, But I I believe, is this your first book? No, this actually is my third book. Got it. Okay. So, oh, Superbug and Beating Back the Devil. Yeah. So so this is focusing particularly on the poultry industry where, where it concerns antibiotics and 
and actually a whole lot more. <laughs> it's a very monumental book. So um, I just want to also mention, um, Marin, it's very clear to me from the very beginning of this book that you are a person who cares deeply about food, and not just for scientific or political reasons, but for the actual zeal of like eating well. Um, that is because you start out this story in uh, describing this wonderful market in France that has the most delicious chicken. <laughs> Do you want right. to tell us a little bit about that? It made my mouth water so much. <laughs> the rotisserie. So, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you for noticing first that, that uh, I'm interested in food. One of the reasons I wrote this book uh, is that I feel as though it ought to be possible as meat eaters to be concerned about how meat is produced and ask questions about it, but still want to eat meat when you come out the far end. Uh -huh. And that was certainly true in this experience I had in Paris. The prologue of the book is the story of me encountering this chicken that just sort of blew my mind, which is a very average, everyday kind of roast chicken. Okay. It's sold in markets all over France. This particular one happened to be in um, the Bastille market, which is held twice a week in the Place de la Bastille in the 11th arrondissement. Um, thousands of people buy their food there all through the week. Um, and uh, this one chicken was <laughs> a chicken that had been spatchcocked, crapaudine in French, crapaudine. and had been roasting for several hours in a portable cabinet that they roll in and was so delicious, was crisp and herbal and salty and mm. a little bit burned. Um, but what was so striking about it was that the, it wasn't just the skin with all the herbs and the salt on it that was delicious, but the flesh mm. was delicious too, in a way that I never really thought that chicken could be, you know, that mm. it, it was rich in mineral and it, it tasted like an animal as opposed wow. to just kind of tasting like a lump of bland protein. Or and like a bunch of spices. made yeah. me want to find out more mm -hmm. about chicken. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing to like really appreciate those actual nuances within the meat and, and to be able to pick, to pick them out, um, at all, you know, when you compare it with today's, some of today's meat, I guess, was it a big departure for, uh, um, or was it a big difference to you from the meat that we find from chickens in America? It definitely was. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, you know, the chicken that most of us eat in America, it's incredibly predictable. Um, we've, we've built a, a, a system in which, of meat production in which predictable is one of our chief virtues, mm -hmm. along with consistency and efficiency, and low cost. But, but when we enshrined efficiency and consistency and predictability and inexpensiveness as the chief values in our meat system, mm -hmm. my belief is one of the things that we lost is flavor. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was kind of a shock to me to eat this chicken that was intensely flavorful, uh, you know, of itself before the seasonings were added to it. And it made me want to ask, wh how did we get to the point mm -hmm. in our meat production system in the United States and increasingly around the world in which flavor was not a thing that mattered so much? Yeah. And it's also, um, we didn't just sacrifice flavor. Um, f as your book tells, there's been a lot of um, dangers associated with the way that we produce food. Um, you write that antibiotics have been so difficult to root out of modern meat today because, in a crucial way, they created it. Um, so if it weren't for those antibiotics, we wouldn't have the chicken, the big chicken, that we see today. Um, and that's, that's a whole long story. But, Marin, to start out, do you want to tell us a little bit about the origins of antibiotic use in, in animal and um, in agriculture? Sure. And, you know, I actually was surprised when I started researching this to realize how deeply rooted and also how long this history right. is. So just to be clear, uh, most of the meat animals raised on the planet now get antibiotics at some point during their lives, and not for short periods just to cure an infection, but routinely in their food and water. And we've been doing that since the early 1950s. They, uh, livestock have been given antibiotics first because they, those antibiotics cause them to put on weight, mm -hmm. muscle mass, the tasty muscle mass that we want to eat, more quickly than they would otherwise. And antibiotics also, again, in very small doses through food and water, um, they protect animals against the diseases that might spread in the crowded conditions right. they are held in, whether that's in barns right. or in chicken houses or in feedlots. 
And both of those uses of antibiotics are quite different from the way in which we use antibiotics in people, which is oh. only to cure infections. Now, there oh. is some use of antibiotics to cure sick animals in agriculture as well, but, but the vast majority of antibiotic use by volume goes to those other uses. And as it turns out, this use of antibiotics goes right back to the beginning of the antibiotic era, uh-huh. which is the end of World War II. So antibiotics come on the market. Um, the first antibiotic, penicillin, arrives in about 1943 and is rolled out across the battlefields of World War II and is so successful that I other love that story. makers of yeah. medications mm-hmm. decide that they want miracle drugs in their portfolios that it are, will do as well as penicillin is doing. Mm-hmm. And so within about 1943 and 1948, we get all the drugs that mark the beginning of what we now think of as the antibiotic era, and that's drugs like chloramphenicol and streptomycin and the tetracyclines. They're all the first foundational antibiotics. Mm. I love how like virtuous it all seemed because, you know, it was like this pair of scientists smuggled penicillin from from Britain so that they could develop it in the U.S. and then hence save thousands of lives on the battlefield through this miracle drug that they produced and so forth. It's like it's it's a hero, you know, in a way, <laughs> penicillin. Right. I mean, and, these were they called them miracle drugs, right? Mm-hmm. These really were hero medications. And um, no one at 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 that point or almost no one, could see any downside to Mm. using. I mean, it's an odd historical fact that Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, warned right at the start of this story in 1945 when he got the Nobel Prize that we should be very careful about how we use antibiotics, that if we did not use them very conservatively and protect their power and conserve them, then we would lose them because bacteria would become resistant to their action. Oh my gosh. And yet, just three years after Fleming made that warning, a scientist who was working for one of the companies that made one of those first antibiotics added tiny doses of the company's antibiotic, which was chlortetracycline, the first of the tetracycline class, to the diets of experimental chickens. Uh-huh. He was looking for an inexpensive supplement to make animal feed more nutritious, which and that was needed because in the wake of World War II, the um, the industry was contracting and was trying to save save money, save expenses, and so they needed they were giving more cheap feed and they needed supplements to boost the nutritional value of the feed. Mm-hmm. And when he gave those tiny doses of chlortetracycline to chickens, the chickens in his in his experiment who received the drug gained more than twice as much weight as. Any uh, as the chickens that had not gotten the supplement, and and from that, the entire industry of giving antibiotics to livestock was born. Boom! Miracle. Yeah, and nowadays um, we can grow chickens with twice as much meat in t- in like half as much time. So, hence cheaper chicken. Right, and so you know, in my view, the giving of antibiotics routinely to to livestock to meat animals is is really the thing that launches the meat production system that we have today. Because Mm -hmm. once you start thinking of animals as a thing that you can move more quickly through a process, like Mm -hmm. an assembly line, think of them as something to be produced efficiently, Um, then, in my view, we start getting the the very large barns and we start getting the desire to to change their shape physically to Mm -hmm. make them more like what we want to eat. Um, you know, chickens are, have a very different shape than they did 70 yeah. years ago. We start getting the, the um, precision nutrition that makes them different. We start getting the genetic tinkering that gives chickens in particular an insatiable appetite that um, is, is something that now has been bred into them. And all of these, I think, all of these changes begin mm-hmm. with our, our tinkering with their metabolisms by giving them antibiotics. And all this was in the quest of like feeding the world. And um, because, you know, before it sounds like backyard chickens were part of the farm, but not necessarily the product of a farm. They were just sort of a byproduct of running a farm. You'd kill your egg laying hens for meat once they were done with most of their egg laying years. And, um, but, you know, everything with the best intentions of feeding the masses after the post war boom. That's right. And, I, I, you know, I think it's important, looking mm-hmm. back at this story, that, that 
there are there are no or very few villains in it. Everyone who takes an action in this long history does it with the best of intentions, but without really looking far enough ahead to all the possible consequences. So yeah, so after World War II, there was a lot of concern that because of the destruction of the war, that the, the whole industry of food production was very fragile and very subject to disruption. And so there was a real concern that food be made as affordable as possible and as accessible as possible. And there was also, at the same time, this very uncomplicated trust in science. You know, I think we all mm-hmm. have heard at one point or another that famous Dow Chemical slogan, <laughs> you know, better living through chemistry. <laughs> And, and those, those two things combine, that uncomplicated technology. trust in science yeah. and technology and, and that belief that we have to feed the world at any cost, combine to create this meat production system mm-hmm. in which there are all these external consequences, or mm. all these consequences that are held as external to the cost of meat, from, from environmental pollution to antibiotic-resistant bacteria to increases in foodborne illness, that are all those, those are all the unintended consequences of those changes that were made 60 years ago. You know, I thought it was interesting that Europe and other countries saw the need to put regulations on antibiotics and agricultural use from like the 70s on. Um, and yet America didn't do that until 2013. It is, although to, to give us some credit... We did try Wait, to there was one attempt. farm antibiotic use in 1977, and an activist FDA commissioner at the time uh, tried to withdraw the licenses that the FDA granted in the 1950s for growth promoter antibiotics, and mm-hmm. he was foiled by political interference from Congress, and that started a stalemate between the federal agencies and the veterinary pharma and agricultural industries that lasted for decades. Wow. But it is true that that movement on this came first in, in England and in Europe. First in England, actually. Uh, the United Kingdom in 1969 became the first government to allow inquiry into mm. the effects of farm antibiotic overuse and misuse. And that was because England, being such a small society where agriculture was much more kind of interpenetrated into um, the, the settlement of people in cities and towns, you know, not sequestered thousands of miles away in the Midwest like we have it here, um, they started to notice outbreaks of increased foodborne illness and antibiotic-resistant foodborne illness, which was something that had never existed before. And so in 69, uh, a committee of the British government uh, reported that they believed that the government should control growth promoter use. And in fact, that happened in 1971. Mm-hmm. Parliament voted them out. They were followed by the Scandinavian countries right. in the 1980s, yep. and then all of the European Union in 99, and then a, a tougher ban in 2006. So they listened to their uh, Cassandras, if you will, of, of science and, you know, taking control of this. Um, so, but what happens in, in America in 2013? Things come to... Uh, <laughs> Stuff hits the fan, if you will. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so, you know, there was this long stalemate mm-hmm. uh, from uh, in 1977 when that FDA commissioner in the Carter administration was unsuccessful in, in getting the FDA to withdraw the licenses that it had, um, uh, it, it had granted in the 1950s. Part of that political interference was that the congressman who led the interference into the FDA's actions threatened the agency with the loss of its entire budget, Mm. and put a, a rider on the FDA's appropriations that they would not be allowed to investigate the consequences of farm antibiotic use and renewed that rider every chance he got. And so mm. that, that congressman didn't, um, didn't uh, retire until the 1990s. Okay. <laughs> so there was, there was a, 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 a long um, wow. history of there being it being unable for there to be anything to be done. Wow. Um, and then a set of administrations that didn't really want to move on it after things relaxed a bit. But then the Obama administration came in, and they came in with a real desire to make change in a number of ways, and one mm-hmm. of the ways was to change this, this, what the rules were around farm antibiotic use. And they did something very smart. So instead, they didn't go after the demand that is, they didn't go after farmers and say mm-hmm. farmers are no longer right. allowed to do this. What they did instead was they went after the supply side, mm-hmm. the veterinary pharma manufacturers, and they asked 
uh, the veterinary pharma manufacturers to change the labels on their drugs. Now, labels have the force of law in American drug law. And so if they changed the labels so that growth promoters were no longer legal, then no one would be able to use antibiotics in a growth hey, promoter fashion. That's one way to and do it, and yeah. the companies agreed, somewhat, uh-huh. to every, somewhat to everyone's surprise. Yeah. So by January 1st of this year, um, when the, those regulations, uh, technically they're called guidances, went into effect, growth promoter antibiotics, one Woo-hoo. of the key uses of antibiotics, became not legal in the United States. Well, that's a milestone. How about it for 2017? Something good happens this year. <laughs> true. It, had, when it went into effect on January 1st. Uh-huh. Now, that doesn't mean that the problem is solved in the United States right. because that other use of antibiotics, preventive use, preventing yes. or, uh, or infection, or prophylactic right. use, preventing um, diseases from happening in barns and feedlots, that is still legal. Okay. It is supposed to be done under the control and oversight uh, of veterinarians. Now, it used to be that a farmer... Could, a producer could walk down, drive down, sorry, to a, a farm supply store and just buy antibiotics on their own or buy them over the Internet. Here oh. on my desk at home, I have a two-pound bag of chlorotetracycline <laughs> that I bought. Are you a uh, veterinarian? That no one asked me any questions oh, about man. my credit card number. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you can't get everything um, at once, certainly. Um, Marin, we're going to cut to a quick little commercial interlude, but we want to hear much more about this story right after the break. I don't think there's anybody worthy to run this company but the people who built it. I have employees who've been with me for more than 30 years, and plus, each and every one of them deserves to be an owner. That's just the way it ought to be, and that's just the way it is. This is Bob Moore. He and his wife, Charlie, started Bob's Red Mill almost four decades ago. Today, they offer one of the largest lines of organic whole grain foods in the country. And in 2010, on his 81st birthday, Bob gifted ownership of the company to his employees. I'd received plenty of offers to buy my company over the years, but selling out never felt like the right thing to do. When the time comes to let someone else run this show, I can't imagine selling it to a stranger. Giving the company to my hardworking employees just feels right. The company now has an Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or ESOP. Stock is put in a retirement plan for all of its employees. When employees retire, the company buys back their shares. According to the National Center for Employee Ownership, about 11,000 companies in the U.S. currently run as ESOPs. It just shows how much faith and trust Bob has in us. That's Bo Thomas, the company's engineer and maintenance superintendent. He's been with Bob's Red Mill for over 27 years and has put his four children through college in the process. For all of us, it's, it's more than just a job. And, and obviously, it's the same way for Bob, too. Bob is still very active in the company. He's the president and CEO, and you'll find him working at the mill just about every day. Because when you love something this much, you want to be a part of it. Well, I may have given them the company, but the boss part is still mine. Bob's Red Mill is committed to sharing only the freshest, best-tasting whole grain foods on the planet. Learn more about their mission of good food for all at bobsredmill.com slash podcast. All right, we're back chatting more with Marin McKenna. She's the author of Big Chicken, the incredible story of how antibiotics change modern agriculture and change the way the world eats. So we were just talking about how growth promoting antibiotics just sort of got regulated in this country. Um, I understand, though, that that a lot of things have been going on with regards to human health. And um, certainly you're an expert about um, antibiotic resistance. Um, from your book, Superbug, and so forth. But 2013 was a crucial year because it was discovered that, you know, there was resistance to to many more antibiotics than we could keep up with, and the pharmaceutical companies could keep up with making enough (laughs) new antibiotics. Right. So the backdrop to this story of farm antibiotic use, and the reason why we really care about it, it's it's for two reasons. Um, The... The, the overall reason is that, that 
when we give antibiotics to animals, it creates resistant bacteria, drug-resistant bacteria in their systems that then move away from the animals either by departing the farm with them in the meat that they become when they're slaughtered or departing the farm through their manure, which then moves into the environment and releases those bacteria and the resistance DNA that they contain Mm -hmm. into a variety of pathways from groundwater to surface water to wind to insects and so forth. But the reason why we care that those bacteria are becoming resistant is that the most, not all, but most of the, bac- of the antibiotics that have been used on farms are the exact same ones that we use in human medicine. Oops. So yeah. if bacteria become resistant on the farm to an antibiotic, and then those bacteria move away from the farm and cause an infection in a human, that infection can't be treated because we already wasted the power of the antibiotic we would have used by using it on the farm. And, and the, the, the background reason why that is so important is that antibiotic resistance is getting worse around the world. Right. And we have no new drugs to counter it. Antibiotic resistance has been getting so bad that I mean, at the moment 23,000 Americans die every year from antibiotic-resistant infections. Two million people are sick enough to seek health care advice or go to the doctor or hospital. And drug companies, seeing that rise, have decided that it really is not cost-effective to make new antibiotics anymore because as soon as you make the drug, it's... resistance begins to emerge and you, you don't make enough money in sales to earn back your very substantial research and development. Oh, yeah. It's ineffective within a matter of how, how long do these... It can be within five years. You can start yeah. to see serious, you know, a, a serious degree of resistance to a new drug. And, you know, the commonly accepted numbers are that it takes about 10 years and about a billion dollars to bring a new drug of any kind to market. Those may actually be conservative numbers now. So if you are a drug company and you are, are producing a new antibiotic uh, and, and you know that within five years... People may not want to prescribe your drug because they're worried it may not be effective. Or, conversely, your drug is so great that medicine doesn't want to use it at all, but instead wants to to kind of keep it on the shelf until things get very bad. Neither of those are conditions in which you think you're going to earn back your R&D. And so, you know, the companies have reasonably, from a pure economic point of view, decided they don't want to make antibiotics. But the result has been that there are no more defenses against the rise of resistance. And so, therefore, it's really critical that we dial back any practices that encourage the development of resistance, and farm antibiotic use is one. It sounds like we just need to separate our antibiotics from medical use and in farm use. Is that... Uh, is that a, any, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding the science here, but, you know, it sounds like let's not mix so that we're not resistant to the really important life-saving, you know, drugs that could save people's lives. That's right. That's exactly right. And what, uh, there have been several sort of efforts, both in the U.S. and internationally, to make exactly the kind of differentiation that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. There's a, a piece of legislation mm-hmm. that has been introduced in Congress you know, Congress after Congress after Congress for probably a decade now. It's called the, the Preservation of, of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, okay. HAMTA. Cool. Um, and what that piece of legislation says is that antibiotics that are useful for humans ah. should no longer be allowed to be used in agriculture, only antibiotics that have no effect, the, the, the resistance to which would have no effect on human health. Mm -hmm. And globally, the World Health Organization, just about a a month ago, called for a complete dial back on antibiotic use on farms, not just growth promoters, but also preventive use, basically taking any Mm. uh, antibiotic important for human medicine out of the agricultural mix entirely. And both of those those aim at the same goal, which is the goal you're articulating, which is to, to slow down the evolution of resistance uh, in bacteria for which we need critical antibiotics. Now, do you think that's a plausible way to to stop this problem of resistance from growing? I do think so, Mm -hmm. Um, for a couple of reasons. I think there's a couple of good pieces of evidence. The first is that, you know, we talked a little while ago about how Europe is way far ahead of the United Ah, States in this mm -hmm. process. 
And there are countries, particularly the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands, where the crackdown on farm antibiotic use has been very, very strong and mostly done with the cooperation of farmers and, mm. and product, big national production groups. So it's Great. considered a joint national. And you can see in the data in those countries, which is much better than the data we collect here, that not only are, is the occurrence of resistant bacteria in going down, mm-hmm. but also the occurrence of resistant bacteria in humans that have, that have a farm connection is going down as well. So first, we can see that it really does make a difference to wow. human health. Yeah. The second is that here in the United States, some forward-thinking meat companies are turning, they act, are turning away from antibiotic use and actually started doing this on their own in advance of the Obama administration rules. And the ones who really led the parade on this is Purdue Farms, which uh-huh. were the fourth largest chicken producer in the United States. They announced in 2014 that they wanted to go antibiotic-free to mm-hmm. the degree that they could, and they now are very close. And yet they are still producing very, very large amounts of chicken at effectively okay. the same price as mm-hmm. they were before. They've done a number of other things in their chicken production, from changing birds' diets to allowing them natural light to giving them exercise um, to taking uh, some components of the diet away, that they... they are still running a very efficient, very consistent, very, very high production meat system, just happen doing it without right. the use of antibiotics. And if they can do it, then any other country That's very should promising. be able to do it too. Yeah. Exciting. And, and I, I, did, I noticed you wrote about turkeys recently, because they're also involved with the regulations and, and antibiotics. That's and, right. So I, I just yeah. did a piece for Wired magazine mm-hmm. um, about... Uh, how this was essentially the first uh, antibiotic-free Thanksgiving, or it was meant mm-hmm. to be, because any of the turkeys that were served for Thanksgiving this year would have been hatched after the rules changed on January 1st. And so I asked, what do things look like? Well, it turns out that this is kind of a cautionary tale, yeah. uh, because um, turkey producers know that that consumers are really alert to this problem now and really want companies to move towards sacrificing as much of their antibiotic use as they can. Purdue, in fact, the chicken producer, said that the reason that they made the change was because they were hearing so much from their customers about this, something like 3,000 comments a month about antibiotics. So, But turkeys live longer than chickens, and they are raised in a okay. different manner, different kinds of barns than chickens, and so they are subject to some different disease threats. Sure. Are. And so turkeys turn out to, even though turkey producers are trying really hard, mm-hmm. it, it turns out to be sort of an object lesson in how the other meat mm. species, turkeys and pigs and cattle, all mm-hmm. of whom live longer than chickens, have different housing than chickens, in some cases get moved around to different barns or locations during their lives, they're going to be more difficult. Chicken, mm. it's lucky that we started with chicken because chicken in some ways is the easiest animal to manage this in. And so it's... It, it, it serves as an example for where we want the rest of the meat production system to go, but it may take the rest of the meat production system a little longer to get. Right, right. But hey, that's that's pretty cool because chickens were what really started us on this path. They were the first guinea pig, if you will, for Isn't this. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah I think that, that when I, you know, I, I started out thinking that I just wanted to write a book about antibiotic use mm-hmm. in agriculture, and it was only after I started oh. uh, investigating this that I realized that chickens kind of bracket this story in a yeah. beautiful way, because chickens, as you say, were in the first experiment. So chickens kind of led the rest of meat agriculture into misusing antibiotics, and now it seems to me like chickens are going to be the ones to reverse that yeah. mistake and show the rest of meat agriculture that, that we can do without the drugs that they once insisted on. Wait a minute, Marin. Do you think we're going to have crapadin poulet <laughs> in America markets anytime soon? Wouldn't that be soon? wonderful? So, at the end of the book, I actually go in search of a um, of an American chicken that tastes like that French oh. chicken tasted, uh, and I found it. I found it in a in a, a restaurant in New York at Marlowe and Sons in Brooklyn. Hey, um, that's a awesome. wonderful roast chicken that came from under the brick uh, a farm in upstate New York. Uh-huh. I believe it was Snowdance Farm oh. that was um, you know, not cooked in exactly the same manner. Uh-huh. It wasn't uh-huh. spatchcocked, but it was um, it was delicious, and it had that same kind of integrity of taste Ooh. that my. 
French chicken did. And, and importantly, you know, both, both that, that French chicken would have been a La Belle Rouge chicken, which is a, a French certification for birds that are raised outside and fed in a particular way and of particular genetic lines. And the chicken I ate in Brooklyn was also a pastured chicken. Uh. But, but a, a really exciting thing about the move away from antibiotics mm-hmm. is that all the things that even the very large producers are doing to restore, to support birds' health in the absence of antibiotics, like giving them herbs and beneficial bacteria and allowing them to exercise and giving them natural light and in some cases giving them outdoor access. In some cases, even changing the genetics a little bit so the birds Mm. grow a little more slowly and live a little bit longer. Those are all things that support the immune system in the absence of antibiotics. They're also things that return flavor. Yeah, exercise, eating a more varied diet, eating um, herbs and things like that. There are those are all things that are going to make chickens taste different. Yeah, and and I can't wait. Exciting to the point where we yeah. get a more you know an industrial scale chicken that tastes like chicken used to taste. Then I'll think we we really will have fully completed this evolution away from mm-hmm. this mistake of using antibiotics and we can do it Mm -hmm. you know that people like purdue are showing that we can do it without relying solely on gorgeous beautiful pastured farms that we can do it with the very intensive meat production system that makes protein affordable for most of the world and that i think is really fascinating that is really, really exciting to hear about. And it's wonderful to hear, like, so many opportunities to to hone in on flavor, just in general. Um, that sounds like... A, and it's good to hear that you're so optimistic about this as well. So um, we're looking forward to that that chicken of the future. Maybe some heritage birds will make it in there. I, I hear they're doing some breeding uh, attempts, too, uh, to bring some, some older birds types out. But we'll see. Um, that's about all the time we have for today, but thanks so much for joining us, Marin. Oh, and thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. We really, really appreciate having you on. And uh, your book, Big Chicken, is cer- certainly one of the best books of the year, in my opinion. It's out from National Geographic. I hope everyone checks it out, maybe as a gift. And um, thanks, everyone, at Heritage. We'll see you next week on Eat Your Words. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Never had no loving like this before. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like 
It's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.